Buenas tardes, bienvenidos a todos. Para la facultad y específicamente para el Centro de Investigación Básica y el Grupo de Cognición Numérica, es realmente un privilegio tenerlos acá este, y también tener al profesor Justin Jalverda de la Universidad John Hopkins. Um, yo quiero ocupar nada más que los dos primeros minutos este, para intentar decirles algunas cosas de Justin y también algunas de las cosas que hemos pensado junto con el grupo que trabaja en comisión en la facultad sobre la importancia de este tipo de eventos que trata de vincular al mundo de la investigación, al mundo de la academia, específicamente en las áreas cognitivas, con el mundo de la educación, pero específicamente con la toma de decisiones en educación. Nos parece que este es un camino que por suerte coincidimos con muchas de las autoridades, incluso algunas aquí presentes, que pensamos que Uruguay tiene que recorrer y que tiene que recorrer cada vez más profundamente, no necesariamente más rápidamente, pero sí más profundamente, en cuanto a estrechar esos vínculos y que entonces cada vez sintamos mayor seguridad a la hora de tomar decisiones políticas que afectan a la educación y poder decir que las tomamos en base a la evidencia científica que disponemos. El hecho de tener el honor de poder escuchar a Justin Halberda, que sin lugar a dudas es uno de los expertos mundiales en el tema de las bases cognitivas de la matemática, nos parece que es una buena excusa para reforzar ese vínculo entre academia y política y por eso no queríamos dejar de mencionarlo hoy sabiendo que hay mucha gente del mundo educativo que nos visita. La vocación del CIPSI y de todo el grupo que estudia cognición en la facultad, no solo el CIPSI, también el CICEA, que es una estructura digamos, nueva del espacio interdisciplinario y que colabora con todas nuestras actividades, es justamente esa, es justamente eh, afianzar esos vínculos para que sintamos cada vez más el orgullo de tener un país que puede permitirse el lujo de que sus tomadores de decisiones estén hoy escuchando a uno de los máximos referentes, en este caso del campo de las bases cognitivas de la matemática. Ojalá esto lo podamos reproducir en las distintas áreas que trabaja la cognición y que son importantes para la educación, el lenguaje, la atención y todas estas cosas que seguramente hoy aparezcan también en la charla de Jack. Justin Harverda no solo es eh, un experto mundial en estos temas, no lo digo yo, lo dice cualquiera que busque sus muchas publicaciones y sus increíbles aportes. Ha tenido eh, ideas que realmente han revolucionado el campo de la cognición numérica y, y trabajos científicos muy citados. Ustedes van a ver algunas de esas cosas. Pero a mí no me interesa profundizar en eso, porque de alguna manera esa es información que es pública. A mí me interesaría comentar con Justin, que no sé cuánto me está entendiendo porque no se puso los auriculares, <risa> pero seguramente más de lo que estaría él dispuesto a reconocer, me está entendiendo bastante más, que ya tienes de esas personas que siendo quien es, no voy a profundizar en eso, es capaz de, bueno, no solo de tomarse un avión, perder un avión en el medio, llegar este, después de 14 horas, dar una conferencia hoy, otra el viernes, comerse un chivito en el medio, por ejemplo, <risa> sino también es capaz de decirme ahora, antes de empezar la charla, que yo no esté nervioso. <risa> es decir es capaz de, de conectar con la gente en esa dimensión que muchas veces no nos damos cuenta o, 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 o quizás nos damos cuenta pero que solo tiene alguna gente muy particular. Justin es de ese, de ese tipo, de ese tipo de gente muy particular con la cual es fácil colaborar y fundamentalmente es fácil trabajar juntos. Nosotros hemos tenido la suerte de poder trabajar con él desde hace varios años. And now I have to switch to English to say that. We have the privilege to have you here, Justin, in my country, in my faculty, for the first time. So I have to say you thank you again for all this movement that you are doing with us. Thank you very much. Gracias, Ali, y muchas gracias por la invitación. 
Es un verdadero placer estar con ustedes. Uh, mi presentación de hoy será en inglés. Uh, lo siento. <risa> Pero hace muchos años que no habla en español y sería muy difícil para mí. Uh, algunas de mis diapositivas uh, están en español y espero que eso nos ayude. Uh, por supuesto, si sí hay errores, uh, espero que sean solo en el texto en español, solo en el texto y no en mis ideas. <risa> bueno, gracias y uh, ahora uh, comenzaré a hablar en inglés. Ok, thank you. Um, so, today I want to tell you some things that you already know that you will feel natural in your heart, but I want to give you some more scientific reason maybe to support these beliefs. So the first thing I would like you to do is a math problem, and I'm going to ask you to calculate x, to find x. Uh, you could do it on paper if you want, but um, you could also try in your head. Okay, so here comes the problem. Okay, and you can stop. You don't have to solve. You don't have to. Because the thing I wanted you to experience is the groan in your stomach you feel when this comes on the screen. Um, and you have a very quick sense of how difficult the problem will be, uh, how likely you will be to get it correct, right? You have all of that sense rapidly and somewhat intuitively from looking at the problem. Okay, so now, I, and this is what we think of, when we think of math class, we think of things like this. Here's another math problem. Okay, in this one, some green dots appear. They are hidden. Some of them leave. Now you should think, how many green dots are still here? Is it more or less? Than the red. Less. And you can answer in Spanish. <laughs> uh, so this problem involved arithmetic operations. You had to do subtraction. Uh, but probably no one ever felt nervous during this problem. No one ever felt intimidated during this problem. This is a very kind of intuitive problem, a basic problem. And this is the story I want to tell you about. I want to tell you the story of two different types of mathematics. One is like the equations, a formal system that we learn in the classroom. The other is intuitive and basic. And we don't have to teach it uh, in the classroom. Okay? And I'm going to tell the story of how these two very different types of math might actually be related to one another. Okay, so one type of math is very complex and very sophisticated. It is the basis of unique human endeavors like commerce. It is held as a grand accomplishment of the human mind. We know of math geniuses. We, if you're fantastic at math, then you are a special kind of person, you know. And it is famously difficult for children to learn in the classroom. It takes years of practice to master mathematics. At the same time, mathematics, simple, basic mathematics, is something that we share with other animals. It's something that's used for looking for food, for keeping track of your young, and for comparing groups. So gorilla and chimpanzee tribes, when they're deciding whether to fight or run away from a competitor group, we'll estimate the number of individuals in that group. Right? Very, very basic ability, estimating the number, and actually, sorry, compare it to our own group. If we have more, we stay and fight. If we have less, we run away. You see? So, number and comparing number is something that's intuitive and basic. So, this is the two sides of mathematics. Okay, what numbers will I be talking about today? So, 
the natural numbers, the counting numbers, one, two, three, four, not going to be talking about zero, which may or may not have an intuitive base, basis, negative numbers, rational numbers, irrationals, imaginaries. There's many parts of mathematics that are cultural constructions, that are built by a culture that has worked on mathematics and learned mathematics for many generations. The ones that seem to be basic and shared with other animals are the intuitions about natural number, the one, two, three, four, the card, the, the, the simple natural numbers. Okay, so now let's do another problem. I'm going to put some dots on the screen, some on this side, some on this side. Your job is to count how many dots are on each side. Okay? Here we go. Okay, here again we can stop because the important experience was everyone in here probably organized the scene into some pattern and started counting serially through the screen. Maybe you started at the top and you went one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Maybe some of you counted by twos, that could happen. That might speed you up a little bit, but still it would be an orderly routine. Okay, this is what happens when we count, when we're asked to get the cardinality of a set precisely. This is a very unnatural activity that takes children many, many years to master. Right? It's very slow. In fact, here's how slow it is. This is how slow it is. This is the response time of people asked to do this problem. And you see, if there are one, two, three, or four items, they're very fast. This is half of a second, right? They immediately know there's three. But if there's five, six, seven, eight on up, the reaction time goes slower, longer and longer for the higher number. It's because it's taking about 250 milliseconds per item, between 250 and 500 milliseconds per item, to count another one. So it's a very laborious activity, and you have to have a long-term memory that stores the words. You have to have a working memory to store which items have been visited. This is why we do it in a pattern, top to bottom, if we're an expert, you know, something like some kind of pattern, right? You have to have an understanding of how this algorithm works, that the last word you say will be the cardinality of the whole set together. So it's a very complicated ability. So now let's try another one. I'm going to put dots on this side and dots on this side. And you just have to tell me, shout out, left or right in Spanish, um, which side has more dots. Okay? Shout it out. Very good. That was, that was like uh, 80, 800 milliseconds. Okay? So it was less than a second was the average reaction time. Okay? And how many of you counted them before you answered? No one, right? No one counted before you answered. So now what we see is this. You have two collections. And you know which one has more items, but you don't know how many they have. This is the approximate number system. This is the basic mathematical intuition that we share with other animals. This is what the gorillas are doing. And the chimpanzees are doing when they're deciding whether to fight or, or run. Yeah? And so we're going to look more at this ability, this ability to quickly estimate, within a blink of an eye, to estimate numbers and compare numbers. Yeah. Okay, let's play some more. Um, I'm going to put some dots up. It's only one set. You have to say, shout out, again in Spanish, shout out how many you think there are. You make your best guess, okay? We want to hear everyone's shout because we want to hear what is the distribution of answers we get, okay? Here we go. <laughs> So we have seis, ocho, diez. Okay, let's see. It was nueve. Okay, here we go again. Ready? Here comes some more. Catorce, catorce, doce, quince, dieciséis, dieciséis. Okay. So if you notice.
notice there, the numbers people said were a little wider. Okay, we had, we had um, uh, 12, right? We had uh, 16, but when we had nine, we just had like six, eight, nine. Okay, let's keep going. One. <laughs> Everyone knows this one? <laughs> In case you missed it, it's that, it's just one. Okay, so people all say one here. Yeah, how about this one? Okay, now we actually see another important result. Humans all underestimate the number of items. So that's true. So you heard in the guesses, people were saying numbers smaller than 47. Humans all tend to underestimate the number. Yeah? And we also see you have a wider set of numbers you're saying. And again, let's try. Yeah, that was, I gave it away. Three, but we all do it. We all are precise for three. So you see precise for one, precise for three, a little bit of spread for nine, more for 16, big spread for 47. This is how it goes. <coughs> and this is the data that shows exactly that. So this is the number of dots up to 50. This is the response. In blue here, you have very precise for one to four. Then you have each dot here is a person's response. And you see there's, the responses spread. And the spread gets bigger and bigger. So at 47, sometimes they're saying 25. Yeah? And so that's the green, the spread. And then this orange beta is saying you might underestimate, you might be below, you might go too small. So these are the ways we measure the approximate number system. And you see that you can map from the intuitive number, the gut number that just can see the dots, and you can map to a number word, 47. The gorillas and the chimpanzees don't do that. They don't map to a word, we do that. So we can start to see a correspondence between our approximate gut sense and our exact number sense. Another part of the approximate sense is that um, we can let them in. Uh, another part is that it's ratio dependent. This means that if the two numbers are far apart, it's easy to see who has more. When you look up here, you can probably see this has more. But if we get them closer, now this is hard. This is a hard discrimination. And so that ratio dependence is something that we look at when we study numberability, okay? All right, so now let's look at, in adults, the relationship between approximate and exact number in the brain and in behavior, okay? This is a task where, uh, this is from Stan de Ham's lab in, in France. This is a task where you only have exact number. Never see any dots, there's no dots here. Your only decision is, is the number I give you less or more than 65? If it's more, you push your right button. If it's less, you put your left button, okay? Here is the reaction time data for pushing the button. So here is 65 in the middle. And what you see is, the closer and closer you get to 65, the slower you are. And here on this side, the closer to 65, the slower you are. Now, this slowness and that curve, how it's curved, that's predicted by Weber's law that we just talked about, the ratio dependence we just mentioned. That predicts this curve. Notice that verbal labels don't predict this curve. They predict, if anything, 66 should be the fastest question. You know, because 66 is the next one I say after 65. 64, 65, 66, yeah, I got it, he's bigger, right? But that's not the pattern. 66 is the slowest, one of the slowest ones in this problem because the approximate number system, that sense of dots and how many, is invading 
the exact number system. Even though the, prop, the task has nothing to do with the approximate number, the, the subjects cannot stop their intuitive sense of about how big 65 is, and about how big 66 is, and about how big 83 is, you know, from affecting their reaction time. And if we look in the brain, this area, so the inner parietal sulcus, if you had your hand over your ear to cover up your ear, it would be right under your knuckles. It would be right here under here. So this part of the brain, especially on the right side, is engaged in number, and it's engaged by thinking about approximate numbers. So in orange is the reaction time that we just saw. As you get closer, here's 65. As you get closer and closer to 65, you go slower. Well, the bars are the brain area, the inner parietal sulcus. And the closer and closer you are to 65, the more that brain area is activated. Yeah? So here we see a correspondence between a particular part of the brain, the inner parietal sulcus, and this effect of approximate number. It seems to be the seat of approximate number in the brain. And here's what's interesting, to start to turn to younger, younger subjects. You get the exact same results in children of four years of age. When you do this problem in the magnet with smaller numbers, can't do 65, they, they don't know that, but they, they can do um, bigger and smaller than eight. And you do this task in the magnet with them. The same brain area is activated, the IPS, and you get the same reaction time difference. So even in five-year-olds, you're seeing this interaction between the intuitive numbers, the, the dots, the intuitive way of thinking about numbers, and the formal ability with numbers. Okay, but wait, you might say, but wait. Didn't we learn, weren't we taught in our classes, that children don't understand number until they're around seven years of age? Um, and this lesson came to us from Piaget. And what was Piaget's evidence for this belief? Okay? Piaget's argument, first off, was that number is a cultural construction. And what he meant by that is that number cannot be represented in the sensory motor primitives that the child begins life with. It has to be built. And he looked at children's performance at, in different tasks, number tasks, quantity tasks, and he came to the decision that they don't succeed until seven years of age. And his evidence were things like a failure to understand the inclusion of classes, which I'll remind you what that was, and a failure to understand the conservation of quantity, and I'll also remind you of that. So let's talk about the inclusion of classes. So if you show a child, or even an adult, we can do it right now. If, if you look at this scene, and I ask you some questions, and you might feel yourself have the phenomena. So let's see, you might feel it. So I'll ask you, so how many floor, uh, flowers are there? Uh, yeah, and how many uh, daisies are there? And how many tulips are there? And are there more flowers or more tulips? <laughs> Some of you said tulips. <laughs> you feel it. You feel, even if you get it right, you feel the pool. The pool of the wrong answer. And Piaget found that four-year-olds would outright fail this. They would say tulips. And he suggested that they were failing to represent both the set of flowers and the subset of the tulips and have the relationship between them. And Piaget reasoned that without set-subset relation, you could never fully understand what a number was. So this was crucial to Piaget to suggest to us four-year-olds do not have the cognitive abilities to understand what a number is. What's another failure? Okay, so Piaget had this task put out some candies, two rows of candies, and get them so the child says they're equal. Right, so do I have the same quantity of candies? And you get the child to say yes. And you say, okay, watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to spread these one out. Okay, and then you ask, now, do I have the same quantity of candies? Okay, and now just to remind you of what happens developmentally, 
Let's see how this looks. Okay, Jack, so the first game we're going to play is with these candies right here. So this row will be my candies. And this row will be your candies. Now, do I have more candy, or do you have more candy, or do we have about the same? Yeah, about the same. About the same? Okay. Now, watch what I do. Now, do I have more candy, or do you have more candy, or are they about the same? They're not about the same. They're not? Why not? Because they're farther apart. Because they're farther apart? But do I have more, or do you have more? There's a delay. Delay. <laughs> and gives a good explanation. The four and a half year old fails, right? And Piaget, the beauty of Piaget, but actually let me say this. The beauty of Valentine. Valentine is Piaget's wife. And the vast majority of Piaget's data came from Valentine <laughs> being with the children and seeing what the children are doing. Okay, so Valentine is one of the great scientists in developmental psychology and education, and so it's important we remember Valentin's contribution. Okay, so Valentin and Piaget showed us this kind of effect in many different situations. So here is a quantity of liquid. You show the child two buckets, two holders, and the child eventually says, yes, they're the same. You have to balance them perfectly, and then the child says, yes, they're the same amount. Now watch what I'm doing, I'm pouring mine into this other place. You pour every last drop, okay? And now, of course, he looks taller because this is skinny, yeah? And so now you ask the child, now do, I have the, do they have the same amount of liquid or does this have more or does this have more? And the four-year-old says, this has more, okay? Same kind of effect in liquid. And here is the same kind of effect in, in solids. So this is like a, 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 a Play-Doh. Two balls. Now look what I'm doing. Smash, 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 smash. You push it down. Now you ask, um, do I have? Do these have the same amount of play-doh, or does this have more, or does this have more? And the four-year-old again will say, this has more. And they show consistency within child. Piaget's phenomena are real. I mean, they are strong. Okay. So we, we have to, if we're going to theorize about them and say children have some ability earlier than Piaget thought, we need to answer why. We have to take it on, the challenge of Piaget. Okay, so some of the responses to this partic these particular tasks. The main response has been, maybe there is a difference between competence and performance. What the child can understand and what the child can demonstrate. So, um, for instance, if you look younger, so three-year-olds now, you could ask, are all of these flowers tulips? And the child will say, no. This seems to require set-subset relations. Yeah? Um, are some of these flowers tulips? The three-year-old child will say, yes. Again, seems to require set-subset relations what Piaget thought they lacked. <coughs> For the conservation tasks, some, of the, some people have suggested these questions are strange because I'm pragmatically bizarre. Because I just told you they're the same, then you did something 
And now you ask me again if they're the same. You know, why would you ask me that? Why would you ask me if they're the same again? I just told you the same. You must want a different answer. <laughs> yeah? So it may be a pragmatic failure rather than a failure to actually understand the conservation of quantity. Um, and, and they're very verbal tasks. Um, you're asking a four-year-old who's not good at verbal tasks to succeed in what is a strongly verbal task. So these might be some of the concerns about the Piagetian task. But I have to say, even if we look younger for the case of number, we find some interesting failures and interesting challenges with understanding explicit number, and in particular, uh, counting, okay? So this, this video is in French, just to add to our mix, okay? This video, <laughs> this video is in French, but um, for the translator, I will translate to Spanish this video. Okay? Okay. ¿Qué son estos? Um, unos. Yo no sé. No sabes. Son unas ranas. Sí, ranas. ¿Puedes cantarlas, por favor? Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis. Bueno, pues, ¿cuántos son? ¿Cuántos? Dos. Dos. Ok. Every, every single person in this room would have done exactly this behavior, or did exactly this behavior, for six months of your life. With over 5,000 children tested across multiple labs, we have never found a child who doesn't go through this stage. This stage is the child understands counting, but understands counting as an ordered game. So one, two, three, four, five. You know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. A, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It's just ordered game. It's a song, yeah? They do not understand at all that the last count, the last number, is the cardinality of the set. Okay, when they first come to understand that, they'll understand what one means. So if you ask them, can you give me one, they'll give you one. If you say, can you give me two, they just give you a handful, a random graph. Three, four, five, all the same, just don't know, okay? Six months it will take, Six months of reading books with mom and dad and counting and doing, six months to understand what two means. So now if you say, can you give me two? They give you two. And if you say, can you give me three? Handful, four, five, six. <laughs> six more months to learn three, okay? Six more months to learn four, and the day they learn four, the very day they understand four, boom. They understand every single number in their count list. Five, six, seven, eight, however high they can count, they understand. And the story about why the explosion happens at four is an interesting story, but I want to point out for you something to help you get what might be the story. Remember when we looked at our first graph with reaction time, how long it takes you to see how many dots there are. If there was one, two, three, or four, you always knew the answer right away in 500 milliseconds because you know that answer by using parallel attention. Parallel attention can grab three or four things at once. But above that, you can't grab it once. You have to count, you see? This is why the explosion happens in three or four. So again, we see something interesting about the basic psychology and how it impacts on learning of number. Okay, so now let's go back to, yes. So now let's ask, are there some abilities that even younger children have? So these, this counting problem happens between two and a half and three and a half. Uh, are there abilities even younger kids have? And you say, yes, maybe, but how young should we look? How about this? We'll go into six-month-old babies. So now I want to tell you some results from six-month-old babies, and we're asking, what are the math abilities that these infants have? Okay, this will be a video and um, I'll just explain it as we go. This baby is looking at the screens, and at the top you see what the baby sees. 
So the baby sees these two flipping back and forth, and the baby's switching, and pretty soon you'll notice the baby notices this one. Look, this one is the one where number changes, see? 10, 20, 10, 20, 10, 20. This over here is just other kinds of 10, and the baby gets fixated on 10, 20. Over and over, the baby's staring at 10, 20. 10, 20, 10, 20, 10, 20, 10, 20. And he loves it. <laughs> he loves it. Look, he loves number. He says, I love to do mathematics. <laughs> you see? So, we are all born mathematical people. We are born this way. And what is our job? Our job is to keep it alive. You know, this is our job. This guy, he's going to be a mathematician. He's very happy. Right, so the baby, the six month old, if they're making this decision, they're seeing the difference between 10 and 20 and noticing that numerical change. And seeing the numerical change is more interesting than the side where nothing changes, where it's day one, sorry, where number doesn't change. Yeah. So you do many of these experiments with babies and you find the following pattern. They succeed with things like 8 versus 16, 16 versus 32, and 4 versus 8. But they fail. They do not look differently if it's 8 versus 12, 16 versus 24, or 4 versus 6. So that's puzzling. You have half the time they succeed and half the time they fail. But when you compute the ratios, it stops being puzzling and it starts to make sense. Babies can succeed any time the ratio is 1 to 2. And they fail at a harder ratio, 2 to 3. They also fail at 3, 4, fail at 5, 6. But they will succeed at 1, 2. They'll succeed at 1, 3. They'll succeed at 1, 4. Yeah? So we're seeing ratio dependence in the babies. Ratio dependence reminds you of the approximate number system that we began with. This is the, the shared system that we talked about with the gorillas and the chimpanzees and comparing group sizes. This is ratio dependence. Yeah? or Weber's Law. And infants are less sensitive than the adults are. You and I can sense a finer difference than an infant can. And if we looked at that, and we did, you get this kind of curve. This is age in days. And the babies, um, uh, a nine-month-old can do two to three now. So this is a nine-month-old baby. This is a six-month-old baby. These are groups made into a dot. But here's like three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, around here. And here's adults. And so you see that the precision of your approximate number sense is not fixed at birth. It's not <coughs> put in your brain and then there's nothing you can do about it. It changes your whole life. It gets better and better throughout your whole life. In fact, in another study we did, we looked at 10,000 people across the whole lifespan and the best precision was at 30 years of age. So this is getting better the whole time children are in school. Um, and it's only peaking, if it peaks at all, it's peaking somewhere uh, in midlife. Okay, what about, we did, we did arithmetic with these dots, right? We had green dots come in and get hidden and go away. And we saw that you can do arithmetic. Well, can, you do, can the baby, six month old baby, do arithmetic? would be impressive to tell Piaget, well, actually the six-month-old baby does arithmetic. Let's see, here's how they did it. This is Colleen McCrake and Colin Wynn. Some objects come out, they get covered, some more objects come in, and it comes down. And you measure how long does the baby look. And babies look at this for a little while because they like to look at anything you put on the stage. But crucially, on another trial, you do this. Objects come out, they get hidden, some objects go back in behind. Oh wait, that's wrong. That's supposed to be surprising. <laughs> I messed up my slide. Uh, oh wait, maybe I have two slides. No, no, I messed up. Take these away, take these five away. <laughs> okay, so, baby sees five plus five equals five, and now they look longer. Now they're surprised. Six month old baby looks longer at five plus five equals five. Then they look at five plus five equals ten. Okay? So the babies are doing arithmetic, just like you did at the beginning of the, of the talk. Okay, what about the brain? 
What do we know about the brain in six months? Well, it turns out you can measure brain activity in a six-month-old six baby. They wear a little cap like this, and it has sensors on it. Now, these don't do any electricity or anything into the baby. Um, they're looking at the light that's shining under, under the baby's skull, and they use that light, they can tell how much blood flow is happening, okay? And the result is that this same area that I told you about under your knuckles, that same area is active in a six-month-old baby when they look at numerical tasks, when they look at Dot's tasks. Okay, so summary at this point. Infants and kids and adults all share this ability to estimate and compare and do arithmetic um, over approximate numbers of objects. Um, and it's here and observable before the baby can even walk. So it seems to be one of our foundations on which we build our math knowledge. Um, the representations of the approximate system are abstract. They, I didn't show you this data, but they work with sounds too. It doesn't have to be, you know, so if I do this one, let's do it together, ready? Um, I'll make two series of beeps, and your job will be to say which series has more beeps. Okay? the first one though. <laughs> first one. So you can do this with beeps, yeah? And it turns out to work the same way, ratio dependence, you can do arithmetic, you can do all those things. Yeah. So these are abstract representations, they're for sounds and for, for vision, and they're employed in mathematics. So two remaining questions for, for the, this next part of the talk. Where do these representations come from? I've made some suggestions about other animals, but can we look at evidence from other animals? And what's the relationship between this uh, approximate number system and our more explicit mathematics that we learn in school? I've already suggested there's some relation, but can we do more? Can we measure that relationship? Okay, so turning to animals. How am I, how am I doing on time? I'm at 45 right now. You are at 45. Does that include the time you were telling me stories? <laughs> uh, okay. You can continue to 40. Okay. I'll tell. I will tell you a little about the animals, a little more, but not much because then I want to jump to the the map, to the explicit math of it. So if you don't know this story about Clever Hans, this is a good story. Uh, Clever Hans, his owner believed that his horse could do arithmetic. And the way they would test Clever Hans is he would hold up a card with a number, hold up a second card with a number, and then Clever Hans would tap his foot to the answer. Okay. And the owner was very honest. He, he, he really believed this animal could do this. They would go around and show Clever Hans to people. So this is a real picture. This is Clever Hans. And you see all those hats they're wearing? And this is when the beauty comes. <laughs> so, some scientists said, let's really put this to the test. And they did a simple experiment. It was that the shower of the car and all of the observers were not allowed to see the numbers. Only Clever Hans could see the numbers. And when you do that, Clever Hans fails. He has no idea what to do. And so then they started studying how Clever Hans worked. And the answer is this. When you showed the card, all the people here could see the numbers. And they can do math. They can do arithmetic. So let's say it was two and three. And Clever Hans goes like this. And now all these people go like this. <gasps> to wait and see. Will Clever Hans stop? And what Clever Hans had learned to do beautifully was read human behavior and see that it was time to stop. And then they say, oh, great job, Clever Hans, you see? <laughs> so as soon as no one knew, no human knew the answer, Clever Hans could do nothing. Okay, so Clever Hans is a failure, but there have been many, many successes uh, in animal cognition. Um, 
Cheshire, let's just, let's go, rats can do it, but let's go to, these are ducks can do it, and these are monkeys. So, monkeys uh, are taught to push pictures in the order of number. So, one dot, two arrows, three flowers, or no, it's two planes. So, one, two, three, four, and that must be four, four, okay. Uh, so push them in order, right? And then you give the monkey brand new cards the monkey has never seen before, and the monkey is able to succeed. You can also give the monkey brand new numbers that they've never played with before, and they can succeed, suggesting that the monkey, and now many studies suggest this is true, the monkey has learned a numerically ordered uh, relation across estimates. Now, they don't have exact counting. They can't do exactly 27, right? But they can do approximately 8, approximately 9, approximately 10, right? And they can order this way. So this is a mathematical representation and mathematical relations. Um, so other animals, we share with, with, with many other animals, um, and I was going to show you ducks, but we share with many other animals this approximate number system. They all seem to have it. And monkeys have it in the same piece of brain that we have it in. Okay? So when you do imaging on a monkey brain, you find when they're doing the dots games, the exact same piece of brain that we have, they have. Okay? Okay, so, the approximate number system is shared with educated adults and children, and also cultures that lack any written mathematics at all. Um, even cultures that lack number words above three. So there are tribes uh, in the Amazon rain, uh, River Basin, whose languages go one, two, three, many. They just have many above three. Yeah? They also have an approximate number system. And all these other creatures, including the, the recently born baby creature. <laughs> but, here's a question. Does this approximate number system affect our math performance in school? Okay, so this is a graph of preschoolers. And this is how good their approximate number system is. We measure it because they play the dots game. So they play many trials of telling me, are there more blue or more yellow dots? And from that, I can find out from each child how precise is their approximate number system, right? It's not fixed. It's not all of us have the same. We actually have differences, and we can see those differences. Then we also measure these kids' performance on a preschool math exam. And you find this relationship that the more precise you are in your number sense, the better you're performing on the math test. This is before you enter school. So before the child even enters school, there is this relationship between their approximate number system and their understanding of exact mathematics. This is in older children, and looking at children who have shown signs of dyscalculia. So dyscalculia is a disability uh, that affects specifically math performance and not, say, language performance. Okay? And this is low achieving children in mathematics, typically achieving children in mathematics, and high achieving children in mathematics. And this is how bad their approximate number system is. The, the bigger the number, the, the worse their approximate number system. And so we see in these children a relationship that says, if you are, have dyscalculia, and it might be just one subtype of dyscalculia, there might be multiple subtypes, multiple types of dyscalculia, but for one subtype at least, you have a problem in your approximate number system, and that leads to or, or interacts with your dyscalculia. Now this is a predictive study. So this is children who just started school, and we measure their approximate number system with this blue and yellow dots game. So again, this is who has more dots, you know, left side or right side. And we look at their mass performance in the classroom six months later. And you see that we're predicting their performance. The better you are at the approximate number game, the more, uh, the more better you are in school math, 
And in fact, we can look at the growth in math class. So individual differences in dots performance predict growth in school math performance. And in case you think this is only important for young children, these are students at Johns Hopkins University who were accepted to the university. They had to take a math college entrance exam to get accepted. And we got all of their scores. And we got their verbal scores, too, for their entrance. Now they play this dots game. So college students playing who has more, blue or yellow? Who has more blue or yellow? Who has more blue or yellow? It takes maybe 20 minutes, 10, 10 to 20 minutes of playing this game. And we can predict how well you did on the math part of your college entrance exam even controlling for your verbal college entrance exam. So I think this relationship between the approximate sense of number and our explicit performance in number is there for our entire life, is what the, my research is suggesting. It may be very important when you're in your early years, it's true, and it may just compound over time. For instance, if we don't engage the approximate number system correctly, maybe the problem just persists. That's something we still have to come to understand. Okay, now last point, and then I'll stop for questions. If there is this relationship between our approximate gut sense for number and uh, our school math performance, can we teach the approximate number system in order to improve school math performance. And that's what we're looking at together here in Uruguay. So this is just the first project we had. It was a small project, a pilot project. Um, and we worked with um, this, these schools in the Montevideo area. And so we had teachers in each of these schools that were interested in using tablet games in the classroom, and we made tablet games. So we made games for the tablets, and that's something we're still doing. So here is children, here's children playing some of the tablet games. So they're just basic math games, but they also include some approximate number games. So, just to show you one of these, this is an approximate number game, and it'll, it'll explain itself. one of the kids sent us said you know they like this they like this game but some of the other ones you know not so good and, you know we get criticism so that's great um, and so here is just the results from that pilot study before the children play the approximate number system games like the firework game so they play that for a month they play firework for a month they were allowed to do some math tests before so this is the math test before. And we see that the children in the lower socioeconomic status are doing less well than the children in the higher socioeconomic status. So that's unfortunate, but, but expected. But here's what happens after one month 
of playing the fireworks games and other approximate number system games. Okay, so it looks good. Everybody got better. And the medio bajo got as good as the alto. Yeah, so we're encouraged that we can make games that are fun and that we can engage the kids and the teachers also in using the tablet games and hopefully engaging approximate number system. And this is, this is research, it's not just application because we're still discovering together how this all works, how this goes together and is it effective, is it not effective, etc. Okay, so summary. So we all have an approximate number system, and it can be observed as early as six months of age. We're all born as mathematicians. We're ready to do mathematics, which is good news. Um, it's uh, part of our evolutionary heritage, this system. We share it with other animals, so it's not something that we built all on our own. We, we come ready to grow it and expand it. Um, and there is this relationship between the approximate number system precision and your performance in school mathematics. It improves throughout our whole life. And with the work that we're doing in Uruguay, we're beginning to look at this interaction between your approximate number system and how it can impact and change your performance in school mathematics. And so this is, a, this is an ongoing project, and so we're learning together. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, if you'd like to ask your question in Spanish, that is excellent for me. I will try and understand, but also the interpreter could help me if I if I don't understand. When you say that uh, the ANS is uh, approximate, uh, is uh, I'm, I'm sorry, is uh, abstract. It, it operates like an abstract system. So the number sense is abstract too. Do you think that uh, that implies that the concept of the semantics of the number it, it will be always abstract? Like, for example, in adults, uh, the McClock scale, the uh, adult model uh, things. And the other question is is there a single quantification system for time and space as worship think that if it is abstract, it could be the same for any kind of quantification? I, 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 I have not been talking in English for a while, so. Uh, it's fantastic. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, no, very good, very good. Uh, so, I pause because it's, these are complex, interesting issues. I would say there is a kind of abstractness in the approximate number system because it can be abstract with modality, sound, vision, and because it does operation, arithmetic operation plus minus, which is a purely numerical notion. That it has some abstractness, but it does not have, I think, the abstractness that number concept has in mathematics. I think this is even another level of abstraction. And say, learning to count, it, it is so difficult because you have to learn a relationship between number thoughts and symbols that mark those thoughts. And in some cases, I think you may have to build a new thought you never had before, say precisely seven. I don't think any animal has this thought, precisely seven, other than the human animal who lives in a culture that teaches counting. So I think there are levels of abstraction here, not just one question of abstraction. For the last question about 
there's also time. Piaget showed us there's liquid, there's solid, there's time. There's many other quantities we might care about. I do not think, it, uh, I should say, um, there are many scientists who currently believe these are a single system, including some Uruguayans who believe such things. And I try my best to tell them it's impossible. But, but so I don't think it's possible to have a single magnitude representation that is abstract across content because you wouldn't know which content it was. So I think there is related but distinct magnitude representation for time, for number, for space. Is that, is, was this the questions? Yes. Yeah. What's the question? It was very good. Thank you very much. Yo no voy a participar de esta discusión porque hemos tenido varias. Pero sí, voy a hablar en español justamente para motivar que aparezcan otras consultas también en español. Que estaría bien porque además Victoria... Ok, perfecto. Voy en español entonces. Son dos. Eh, una, ¿existen, se ven efectos de diferencia entre, porque me imagino que vos dijiste, auditivo y visual funciona igual, es decir, 3 bits más de 3 bits o 3 puntos más de 3 puntos, etc. Pensaba en táctil también, que seguramente funcione, pero me parece que la linealidad de la audición debe generar un efecto respecto de esta cuestión de atención en paralelo que puede tener lo visual o que puede tener lo táctil. Esa es una pregunta. Y la otra, eh, hablaste de que la precisión en la numerosidad aumenta con la edad y mencionaste los 30 años. Que me llamó la atención que es más o menos la edad del desarrollo de funciones ejecutivas. Esa podría ser una duda. Pero la otra tiene que ver con eso implica entrenamiento. Una, un adulto de 30 años sin ningún entrenamiento desarrolla esa misma precisión. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, two, there's two questions. Uh, for tactation, okay, there have been a couple of studies done with, um, uh, you put your hand on a uh, device that can poke your fingers. And you can sense one, two, three exactly. Four not so exactly and five not so exactly if you spread them across ten fingers, say. So you, it's not, you can't get an icon of five. If you do an icon of, of four and five, you will get it. You will know it was four or five. But that is just really knowing which one finger gets touched, yeah? Uh, I wanted to do a study, and I've all, for more than two decades, where you do tracking of objects as they move, but they move on your body. So you have, you know, volunteers uh, <laughs> touching you and moving around. And you have to see how many you can keep track of, individuals, yeah? And you should see beautiful things like um, the precision of your knowledge of where they are becomes more precise as they come close to higher density. And so they could become closer together there. But on your back, they have to be very far apart for you to tell them apart. So oh, I think all that should happen, but it hasn't been done. It would be interesting. Now, for the 30-year age, I don't know that it's because of training that it gets better and better. I don't know why. Um, the same is true of executive function. It gets better and better to age 30, but we don't know exactly why. It gets better, you know. So I think these are these really are open questions. The approximate number system can be separated from executive control. So there has been one paper who said that argued our measure of approximate number is just a, a measure of executive function. But there's been many more papers that said no, that we don't think that's true. So I think these are separate. But that they. <laughs> develop similarly is very intriguing.
I'd like to know if uh, have you created or invented games or tests, uh, specific tests uh, that you are using in, in plants they buy? So, have we developed specific tests that we use in plants and body? It is not shared with everyone yet, the test that we have developed. Um, the one we're trying, so we started a new project with Seban, and we are trying again with maybe eight schools right now, just trying to see how does it work and can we make it better. If it goes well, I think that this game that we have for this one, I think it could be shared with everyone. I, I, I feel very strongly about this game. It's a good game. So I think we try small first, and if it's good, it shares with everyone. Thank you very much. Yeah. conversations I've had, not from my own research, but from my conversation, that um, problems in language and problems in math are not independent, typically, that the, the best predictor of poor performance in one is poor performance in the other. Uh, for instance, in dyscalculia, there is a high comorbidity with dyslexia. Um, so that's a, that's a question about why is that the case. Um, there, if, there might be, uh, the, right, it's a question why that might be the case. Now, also, in the data, now this is for sure, unless, unless the, in the data, the two abilities correlate highly. So the best predictor of whether someone's a good math student is whether or not they're a good language student. They correlate with one another very highly. Yeah. So 
We have a common sense notion that someone's either a math person or a language person. But from my understanding of looking at this data and talking to educators is that that common sense notion doesn't serve us so well. Bueno, cualquiera de los dos, como son de lenguaje, seguro que van a escuchar. Muchas gracias. Eh, quería preguntarte, ustedes eh, hicieron entrenamiento y vinieron al mes del entrenamiento si hay alguna evidencia de los efectos más dilatados en el tiempo, porque me parece que eso es un, un aspecto clave, es decir, vos podés obtener una mejora pronto con entrenamiento en muchas cosas, pero la pregunta es si ese entrenamiento se conserva en el tiempo y si tiene efectos en el largo plazo. Yeah. Um, ok, so, but can you tell me which, which, but, put on. Yeah. Yeah. which specific training Project, project on 2013. Yeah, but Monster? Uh, no, no, no. Just, no, no. Time? ANS. 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 ANS, generally speaking. Yeah, okay, but I was wondering. It, so in that project that I showed, we had many, many games. So one game, I showed you one game which was the firecracker. Another game was about time perception and related to the question about a general magnitude. It's a fun game. So two monsters, each burp, burp, and then this monster, burp. And then who burped longer? And they get it right. The kids love this game, and this game, burping, correlated with their math performance. And they even predict their math performance. So we're, this was a surprise to me that a time game would work and it would hold for a long time. So we're still looking at these children now, two years later. And it looks like it's, the training had an effect, but we are still looking. We don't know yet. But that's the goal. The goal is games that are fun and engage the approximate sense and have a long time effect. That would be what we want. Can I add one little thing? Huh? Can I add one little thing to the question? Uh, espe específicamente, ahora estamos empezando a mirar justamente los datos de 2015 de esos niños que en el 2013 estaban en primero, cómo les fue en las pruebas SEA de matemática. Con la dificultad que eso tiene, en el sentido de que las pruebas SEA no son de evaluación, son pruebas formativas y, como ustedes saben, este, muchas veces las condiciones de aplicación no son del todo controladas. Al respecto de esto tenemos una reunión mañana justamente con Justin para ver esos datos, pero puedo adelantar en este momento de que son bastante auspiciosos, aunque queremos justamente verlos con mayor detalle y para eso tenemos una reunión con Justin mañana y todo el equipo de, de comisión numérica. ¿Eso estaría aplicando todas las No, 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 son dos cosas distintas, digamos. Eh, esto es parte de la continuación del proyecto y todavía estamos, como dijo Justin, en fase muy experimental, digamos, y por lo tanto no en condiciones para nada de, de extrapolar a todos. ¿sí? Estamos justamente viendo datos chicos, aunque pueden ser de 500 niños, pero que eso es mucho para, para nosotros. Pero con esta perspectiva de entender qué pasa antes de, de proponer una, una cuestión más global. Sobre el problema. No,
tenemos solo una parte de esos datos. Entonces todavía es menor la muestra, digamos. En el 2013 trabajamos con 800 niños y de esos 800, los datos que pudimos acceder de SEA no llegan a 300. Entonces tampoco hay muchos datos como para poder ver eso. De todas maneras vamos a ver cómo se mantiene, digamos, la, la diferencia o la progresión en el nivel socioeconómico. Lo que vimos en el 2013 después de ese mes es que subían todos los niveles pero subían más los del medio y, y eso hace pensar en un efecto como de inversión de curva que sería muy interesante pero no podemos asegurar que eso se, man, se mantenga dos años después está todo en pañales eso porque aunque parezca que 2015 fue hace un año que de hecho lo es este, el proceso de los datos y de, y de poder conectar con los datos y con todas las garantías que eso merece en general lleva tiempo y ustedes sabrán de lo que, de lo que saben entonces, este, no llegaron a ser muy poquito tiempo. Hola, buenas noches. Eh, mi pregunta eh, viene por el lado de si existen pruebas estandarizadas para los menores de 5 años, como el ASQ3 o alguna de esas pruebas, para medir la cognición matemática o el INS, porque... Generalmente no se habla de cognición, cognición matemática, sino de resolución de problemas a niños tan chicos. Y esta evidencia daría lugar como que es realmente predictivo. Y otra, si tienen estudios de panel largos que muestren qué tan predictivo es ese resultado en el resto de la vida. Ok. Um, the, there are some standardized tests. Um, the one that we use is TEMA 3. And in fact, it exists in Spanish, but you have to get it from Spain. They're not, they don't have it in South America for some reason. And they don't have it in America, actually. They have it in Spain. So it's TEMA 3. It's good, but you have to work one-on-one -on -one with the child. So many of the standardized tests have been developed as assessments for school counselors. You know, and you, so you're working one-on-one -on -one with the child. This makes it hard to do it in a classroom with, with, with everyone. Um, for the ANS, so I, I made a program that I made free for everyone. So you can go to, uh, I thought I would say, but it says Panamath. Panamath? This is, has a program that you can download and you test anyone, any age. You put in the age and it adjusts the ratio to be correct. So you can test yourself, you can test, you know, any, anything. Eighth grader, fourth grader, three year old, and it will, it's blue and yellow dots and you can get a measure of how they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, my goal with that would be, I would like to have I would like to have a good task that could standardize for all ages, but it's not, it's not totally here yet, but it's a good step. There, there are um, dyslexia, so how to say this, the, there was a beautiful thing that happened in the 70s and 80s for dyslexia and for reading disability, which was a focus on the cognition of reading. And there were research funding dollars and this is where all of our insights on dyslexia have really come from, and understanding phonological awareness and important parts of reading. Um, that, because of that, there is a whole community of people that work on dyslexia. So I, I don't work on dyslexia. I know that field just to just as a spectator. Um, uh, so no, I haven't worked on dyslexia, but. Uh, But what we're doing now in mathematics, I think is very similar to what happened in the 70s and 80s with reading. So reading, a, a, phonological awareness was not part of our understanding of reading in, strongly in the, before the 80s. And it was the research on basic cognition 
of reading that brought that into existence. So now I'm hoping that we do the same thing with math. Study of the basic foundation abilities in math will open up something for us in how we understand formal math. One question. Um, you talked about language and you said that there's a correlation between language, how good you are at language and how good you are at math. But every time you look into the neuroscience literature, they show that the, the areas that light up when you are doing math are different from the, the areas that are engaged in language. And there's those papers that show that even mathematicians doing highly advanced mathematics are not using the language parts and it speaks to the, the idea that some recursion is language dependent and all the stuff. Um, but let me be more specific. Do you think that there's any role played by language in the arithmetic abilities we have, or we just inherit that from the uh, ANS capacity for addition, just mapping that to word number? I mean, you only need to know the, the syntax of how to build a word to be able to do arithmetic or number composition. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yes. Um, I think that this is a very difficult space to theorize in. Uh, I think it, it is the most brilliant minds of our generation who are thinking about this, these questions. So I have only things to say with great humility about this. Uh, I do not think exact number grows from the approximate number system. I think the role the approximate number system plays is in giving numerical content to our meta-language of exact number. So that is to say, I don't think anyone in here has a representation of precisely 1,652,028. What they have is some sounds, and they know how to manipulate those sounds in accordance with the rules of arithmetic. And so it all works out. So, but what gives numbers that large numerical content, I think, is understanding movement in the number space. So I think the ANS is about movement in the number space. Not about It's about ordinalities, not cardinalities. Now, specific roles to play from, say, grammar or syntax. Um, uh, there I would say, well, I don't know. I would say whatever allows you to build metal languages, then you need it. Maybe you need language, natural language syntax to even understand metalinguistic rules. Maybe you do, I, I, I don't know, but if, if so, then that's what I'd be talking about. this change between three, counting three, and counting four in a child? And the second question, do you think this explanation, do you think it happens the same in different uh, senses? It's hard to study, but maybe there is some evidence from nine children to see if this happens in my children too. Oh, that's a fantastic question. <laughs> yeah, I, I do not, I, uh, <coughs> I don't know. Why hasn't someone looked? I don't know if anyone has looked. I can't, I, don't, I can't pull up in my mind any evidence on blind children. It's a wonderful question. Um, yeah, and I will ask some people who work with blind children. <laughs> um, but my explanation would be that this is about attention, not about vision. So I would, ex I would predict that the children should go through uh, the same kind of insight. Now I don't know if it would happen at exactly four. It depends on <coughs> your ability to uh, apprehend. It does? Someone knows? <coughs> no. Um, it has to deal with your ability to apprehend the items. 
in, in parallel at once. Yeah. Lo dejamos ir a descansar o no. Sí. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.